I get to introduce Ryan Mitchell to you this morning, and I'll try to keep this brief and unembarrassing. You're going to enjoy hearing God's Word opened by Ryan. He is a, a wonderful preacher of God's Word. Ryan and Elna come from South Africa, and uh, Ryan and Elna Mitchell, Elna is a medical doctor, Ryan a uh, student of Semitic languages, and they went to the Master's Seminary in Southern California and then back uh, to South Africa. Uh, Ryan pastored there with Joel James at Grace Fellowship Church. I got to meet Ryan and Elna for the first time while in South Africa, and Ryan was busy being a pastor. Uh, he was busy getting a seminary off the ground to train pastors in South Africa. And then Ryan and Elna decided they would be a part of the team in Papua New Guinea, taking the gospel to people who have no Bible, no church, no gospel in unreached mountain regions. And so Ryan and Elna traveled here to uh, Arizona, and I got to live with Ryan and Elna and Sebastian and Callista. They were in our home for nearly a year, and uh, Ryan... Um, and Elna and Sebastian and Callista became dear friends to us. And then we had to say goodbye. And, and they went and shouldered the labors and the burdens of the team there in Papua New Guinea. Uh, Ryan has been here on uh, something of a, a touring spree, visiting churches, giving encouragements, uh, preaching, hopefully being encouraged. I hope you've gotten some rest. Uh, and then last week's earthquake causes a change in plans. So uh, Ryan and Elder are making plans to get back to Papua New Guinea as quickly as possible and help with the labors there, the assessment, and continue uh, the work. So uh, it's just a joy to have Ryan open God's word for us this morning, a scholar, a pastor, a missionary, and my friend. Ryan, there you are. I've been looking all over for you, hiding in the third row. Come preach God's words to us, brother. I still remember very well the uh, first time Smedley came to our home church in South Africa and he was busy with a presentation uh, the, the Sunday before a uh, conference we were holding. And um, uh, it took, Alna and I were sitting there and uh, Smedley was going through uh, all the work that has been done by this church to send uh, at that point in time. It was... Um, uh, Zach Ann and and the Dodds and uh, Jeremy and his family out and we were about 15 minutes into that presentation and I turned to Alna and I said would you like to do this and uh, she looked at me and she said yes and so it took all of 15 minutes to know we wanted to join this ministry so uh, it's been many years now and we are very thankful um, I would like to encourage you as a church I am ministering alongside Zach Ann in, uh, in the village, and uh, if Zach is an example of the kind of person this church produces, Zach, Cassidy, and their family, this is an amazing church. So let me encourage you, that is a wonderful family, a godly family, and we are privileged to serve alongside them. And really, they are a fruit of this body. And so praise God for that. Well, let's go ahead, get to God's word. Please turn to Matthew 28 with me. And we will be in Matthew 28 going through uh, verses 16 to 20. And we'll be looking at the question really, how do we do missions biblically, or what is missions according to the Bible? Um, somewhat of a cliche that I preach this, but I trust that you understand as I go through this, the church has not, uh, in general, been doing missions in a biblical way. And uh, I could not have said that to you five, six years ago, but having been on the field now for several years, uh, I am frankly shocked with some of the things that I see. 
And uh, we will, as we go through this passage, I trust that it will help us understand exactly what God's plan is as far as missions goes. Well, let me take you to the village of uh, Mauerero uh, and tell you what life is like there. And, um, uh, and, and before we do that, actually, let's le- read the text. Uh, Matthew 28, verse 16. <clears throat> Matthew writes there, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So you've heard much about Mauerero, the village where we work. Well, let me just tell you again what it's like to be there. Our village is very poor. The people lack clothes. They have a very hard time getting basic necessities like the tools that they need, nails, that is a long journey, as we saw this morning from Jeremy. It's, it's a hike out of the village, which is all day. It's an expensive uh, boat ride, which takes several hours. And then they have to go to town. And that's a place that they're frightened to death of because of the way they get taken advantage of and the crime. Uh, Health care in our village is uh, sorely lacking. Excuse the pun. Our people are filled with sores because they don't wash often. Um, This TB is rampant, typhoid. Uh, They have very little medical supplies. We do have a little clinic, but there's very little available to them. The education and level of literacy is very low. We do have a school. Most people only go till about grade three, four, and those that push through all of them really don't get a very high level of education. There's also no electricity and so on. Water supply is poor and they they just, they struggle with all of that. Well, what about the church? We actually have had the church. The Lutheran church has been in Mauerero since the 60s. Our village and the entire region where we work is considered Lutheran mostly. They don't have the whole Bible in the Doe language. The church itself, if you were to go in there, they don't have this. They have guitars that are falling apart and strings are missing and, you know, it's all makeshift. Um, The building is busy collapsing. Um, They need many things. How about PNG? If you were to go to one of those sites like the Joshua Project or look in that book, Operation World, what would you see about PNG? Well, there you would read that Papua New Guinea is 96% Christian, 25% evangelical, and about 1% unevangelized. Now, based on all that information, what would you say missions in Mauerero should be? I can tell you what Mauerero wants. They want us to come in there, in there and give them a relief from the hard life that they have. They want us to come in and help them flourish as human beings and help them be healthy and wealthy. That is their stated desire and it remains their hope that that is what we will do. They want their lives transformed in a very practical way. And I can tell you many churches and missions organizations will say that that is exactly what we should go and do in our village and in Papua New Guinea. In fact, uh, do not do it now, but go and Google and put all those needs, the education, the water, the health, and go and add the word Christian or church or missions organization, and you're going to find churches and missions organizations doing exactly those things. For each thing, you'll find Someone is focusing on that. You'll also find, though, there are organizations that don't do that and they focus on church planting. And yes, the thing, all of us are saying we're fulfilling the Great Commission. All of us claim to be obeying this passage. 
So the question laid before us as the church in general is, what does the Bible say missions should be? What does the Bible say missions specifically in Mauerero should be? Well, the answer is found here in Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20, where Christ, the builder of his church, the master architect, lays out his construction plan for us. And we'll find eight aspects in that plan of Christ's church, in his church building plan. And what we're going to find, I'm going to say this up front, is that we are given by Christ a single task. It is narrow in its focus. What we'll find is that we do not have a multitude of options as to what missions in Mauerero could be, but rather we're going to find one, and it is this. We are to plant churches. That is what missions is about. And this command to plant churches, as we work through this passage, I trust you'll see it for yourself, that it is very clearly in the words of Christ. So you and I, as we think about missions, as we do missions across this planet of ours, we need to be focused within this narrow definition of planting churches. And all that we do should come within the boundaries of planting churches. And so let's look at our text. The first aspect of the church's mission that we find is found in verse 16, and that is the laborers are all disciples. Why don't you read with me? Right there, Matthew writes, But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. At this meeting in Galilee, Matthew is focused on the eleven, on those disciples. Judas is dead by this point. Um, and we have the 11 left. And G Matthew focuses on them here in his gospel because these are the ones Jesus handpicked and trained to be the foundation of his church. And so he zeroes in on them. But what we find, and we just simply don't have enough time to work through this passage in detail. Uh, let me just bring to your attention what we find as we work through the gospels, as we work through Acts, as we work through the epistles we will find that it's not only these 11 that Jesus is sending out and to whom he gives this commission. No, it's to all disciples. In fact, in the context here, we do see already that it is beyond the 11 because look down at uh, verse 19. You see there the scope. The scope of this mission goes beyond what the 11 could achieve. He says, go and make disciples of all the nations. Clearly, Matthew is pointing us and Jesus is giving this to those beyond the 11 and also the duration. Look at verse 20. Jesus says, I am with you always to the end of the age. This task, this command that Jesus gives to the disciples over here is something that must go on until Jesus returns. And so clearly in the context itself, it extends beyond the 11. It extends to all disciples. That means if you're a believer in Christ sitting here today, the commands in this passage are for you and I. In fact, if you can think to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul speaks about an event where Jesus appeared to more than 500 people at once. It's very likely this event. And so Jesus is speaking to more than the 11. He's speaking to many disciples. Well, those are the laborers. All disciples are called to fulfill the church's mission. And we are to do so because Jesus has commanded us to do so. And this leads to the second aspect of the church's mission. That is the foundation, which is the lordship of Christ. You see, the arrest, the trials, and then the execution of Jesus was like a tornado that blew in and just scattered the disciples and blew away any expectation of seeing Christ again. And yet, yeah, Jesus is alive and in the flesh. And so we read the following in verse 17. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. By the way, do you realize that this doubt of the apostles standing there of these 11 disciples, do you realize that that is Evidence, unquestionable evidence that Jesus really did die on the cross. You see, these disciples had no, they doubted the resurrection because they were absolutely certain of his death. 
Do you realize that? Yet at the same time, they realized, as we read in Romans 1 verse 4, Jesus had been declared the Son of God with power by resurrection from the dead. And thus they worshipped him. But Matthew's focus here goes beyond that. It moves to verse 18, and his focus is this. It's the declaration of Jesus' authority. Read with me verse 18. We see there Matthew writes, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Won't you turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians 2? God the Father gave Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, his son, this authority because of his humble obedience. It is God who gave him this authority. Jesus says, it has been given to me, that is by the Father. And we see Paul uh, give an explanation of this in that great passage in Philippians 2, 2, where he points us to Christ as the example of humility. Verse 8 of Philippians 2, we read the following Paul writes of Jesus being found in the appearance as a man. In other words, he was fully man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. This authority of Christ, this is the very lifeblood and foundation of the church's mission. That's why Jesus, back in Matthew 28, he says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and and on earth. Go therefore. You see, the authority of Christ that God has bestowed on him, that has implications for the church. And we start to see that implication in the third aspect of the church's mission, and that is the right of the church's mission, the prerogative of Christ. Uh, Verse 18 again, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore. Go therefore. Today, You and I hear a lot about rights, don't we? Most of it is unbiblical and just the wishful thinking of sinful man. But we, as the disciples of Christ, we have the right to fulfill the mission Jesus has given us. And the reason is because Jesus himself has prerogative. I love that word. It's not one smed that I would use in a sermon often. Difficult to say, and we don't usually use it, but listen to the dictionaries, the Oxford Dictionary, how it defines that word. Prerogative. It's the special right or privilege exercised by a monarch, a king, or head of state over all other people, which overrides the law and is in theory subject to no restriction. Or more generally, It refers to the special right or privilege possessed by a person, a class, or a body. See, God gave Jesus prerogative. He gave Jesus the special right over all other authorities, whether angelic, demonic, or earthly. Jesus overrides all laws of all authorities in heaven and earth. He stands above them. He is subject to none of them. He has prerogative. And do you realize that as his disciples, as his church, as the body of Christ, we have been given, we've been mediated that prerogative by Christ. We have the right to fulfill our mission. That means that when we as the church obey Christ and fulfill these commands that he gives us in these verses, there is no authority or law on earth that can prohibit us from doing so. The apostles, after Christ was resurrected, in Acts 5, we see how they interpreted this in their actions in relation to the Jewish leaders who tried to silence them. In Acts 5, we read the following, verse 28. 
the council, the high council, the rulers of the Jews say this after arresting them. We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. Verse 42, after this event is over, we find Luke records that the apostles every day and in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. You see, this authority of Christ has implications for our mission. If you are a disciple of Christ, you are the laborers God has called to fulfill this mission, and you have the right to do so, even where the law says you may not. Laws like those which say you may not uh, preach against sin. Laws that outlaw biblical counseling. Laws that are hindering conversions to Christ. Laws that are now starting to prohibit us from reading passages of Scripture like Romans 1. You must still fulfill the mission that Christ gives you in this passage. We must heed God's word to Joshua, where he said, be strong and very courageous. Those are words for our times. We as Christians are some of the most faithful citizens. In fact, we are the most faithful citizens in any nation. But we can, where the laws are starting to be passed and starting to prohibit us from fulfilling this mission, we can, with a clear conscience, go out and preach Christ and Him crucified. And the reason is because Jesus is Lord over heaven and earth. Now, His Lordship is also the foundation of the fourth aspect of our mission, and it's this the message we must preach Christ. As Lord, Jesus tells us in, we, in Matthew 28, in verse 18, he says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. When Jesus gives us our mission, what he is telling us to do is to go and do exactly what he did, and that is to preach. For us to fulfill our mission, we must go out and we must preach Christ, but we preach him as Lord. That's the heart of the Christian gospel. Jesus is Lord. Turn with me back to Acts. If we go to Acts 2, we see again how the apostles understood the mission that Christ was giving them and how they fulfilled that. In Acts 2, if you think of these chap- this chapter, it's the first sermon After the Holy Spirit has been given, this is the birth of the church. And look at how Peter ends his sermon, the emphasis of his sermon in verse 36 of Acts 2. This is how he concludes his sermon. Verse 36, Acts 2, he says, Therefore, after having exposited several passages to show that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Did you see that? He has made him both Lord and Christ. The Lordship of Christ determines our message. It means we must preach the fact that Jesus is the Lord. It means we must preach the consequences of that. Us sinners who consciously reject God's word, we consciously reject the truth of God. We are rebellious and therefore we must repent. In Acts 2 verse 37 we read, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Look what Peter says. He says, Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
verse 40. With many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Jesus is the Lord, and therefore he has the authority to tell us what to do. As Lord, he is just, and in no way does he let the guilty go unpunished. Therefore, sinners need to repent. Sinners need forgiveness because Christ will judge. And because Christ is Lord, there is only one way of salvation, and that is through Christ himself. Look at Acts 4 verse 12. You know this verse well, but let me read it for you. We see there written, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. If our gospel message does not proclaim Christ as Lord, what happens? Well, let me tell you about Maurero. Maurero they, when the gospel came in there, and I can't speak to what was initially proclaimed in the 60s, but when Christianity came in, these people are animists, they're pagans, they believe in the forces of nature and so on. Well, all that they did was they took this Jesus and added him to their existing beliefs. We call that syncretism. They just joined the two. And so you come up with things like this. As we've got to know our village and understood what their beliefs are, you come up with a twisted gospel. Listen to this. One group of people told us that Jesus is the son of an evil God, a God who is malicious and does evil to human beings. But he had a son, and that is Jesus. And this Jesus doesn't like the character of his father. And therefore, he came in order to, to teach us to do what is good because he did not like the character of his father. But now when Zach preached the gospel, and as we've been evangelizing people, we have proclaimed Christ as Lord. <clears throat> and because of that, as we've proclaimed the fact that Jesus is Lord, not nature, not the spirits around them, but rather that Jesus is the creator, that he is Lord of heaven and earth, They've heard that truth. They've learned the consequence. We call them constantly to obey the command to believe the gospel and believe in Jesus and come to him and bow the knee. You must proclaim Christ as Lord in the gospel message. That is how we make disciples. They've also learned the exclusivity, the animistic rituals and acts of obedience will not save them. Baptism will not save them. Taking communion will not save them. Rather, they must believe in Christ and his work alone. The Lord Christ is the only hope of salvation. So we see there in our fourth aspect that we must preach Christ as a Lord to fulfill our mission. All laborers of the mission, that's all disciples. The foundation of our mission is Jesus' authority. His lordship gives us the right to fulfill our mission. And the message of our mission, we must follow Peter's example and proclaim Christ as Lord. But where must we go and preach this message to fulfill our mission? Well, we find the answer in verse 19. Read it along with me. Matthew writes, well, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. This is the fifth aspect of the church's mission, the scope. We must go to all the nations. And why? Because Jesus is Lord of all the earth, we must go to all the earth. We must proclaim to men everywhere and declare to them that they should repent. It has always been God's plan, as you know, to save for himself disciples from every nation. Think of Genesis 12 verse 3 and the promise to Abraham. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. 
We read from Isaiah this morning in the service. Isaiah 49 verse 6 says the following, I will make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. That's God speaking to his Messiah, Jesus. And this has an important implication for you and I as we fulfill our mission. We cannot limit ourselves to building the church in the local body alone. We must send out mature believers to go and plant and edify churches where there are no biblically sound churches. And we must go and send them to people groups where the gospel or where there is no local congregation, no mature church. We must send them out. Think of it as Christian urban sprawl, right? We want churches everywhere. And how we do that, we find in the sixth aspect, and that's found in verses 19 and 20. Would you read that with me? Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. The sixth aspect is the tasks of our mission. And the first is this, we must go. And Jesus, because he is the Lord of the earth, we must go to all of the earth. We are not to be lazy laborers. We are to be diligent. If you have friends, do you have family, do you have colleagues? Think of it this way. If it's human and alive, it's a target for the gospel. It's a good way to think about it, isn't it? In our going, we need to be intentional. You and I need to pray to God to give us opportunities to preach the gospel. We need to make opportunities and preach the gospel. We must take every opportunity Christ gives us. Think about the believers in Antioch as through persecution they were forced to spread. And as they went along, they would go to the Jewish synagogues just as Paul would do later And they would preach the gospel amongst the Jews. Well, we're told in Acts 11 that eventually some of them decided, well, why should we be preaching to the Jews alone? There's Greeks too, Gentiles like you and I. And so what they did is they preached the gospel to them and we end up with the church of Antioch, which eventually sent out Paul on his missionary journeys. And when you and I are intentional like that, when we are intentional to go and preach the gospel, Christ builds our local church. Did you not just plant a church? Did you not send people out to Papua New Guinea? See, when we are faithful, Christ builds the local church and then the local church expands it. And so Christ builds his church. But it doesn't stop here. We must constantly push outward and push towards all the nations. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all the nations. And so as we think about that, Jesus says in John 10, verse 16, I have sheep not of this fold. In other words, not just of the Jews. I have sheep outside and must bring them also. And so if you think of Jesus bringing in sheep from all those other folds, from all the nations, in order to get there, you've got to pass through several fields, don't you? And that's kind of a good way to think about this. As you're looking to the nations in the distance, look to the next suburb, right? Look to the next town. Look to the next cultural group. Sometimes our missions field is right in our city where there's a whole new cultural group which has no faithful church amongst it. Look to the next language. Look to the next nation. And as we do that, Jesus is bringing in the sheep from all over the world. In Acts 1 verse 8, we read the following, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. For the Jews, this was very important. They were very exclusive, very inward focused. Well, I would argue it's a problem for you and I too. We live in very churched cultures and we tend to be very inward focused and we get very comfortable doing church, don't we? 
But Christ says, go. We took it literally and went to the ends of the earth. Did you know that that's what Finisterra means in Latin, the ends of the earth? Well, the next task after go is, is make disciples. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all the nations. When he says make disciples, Jesus is saying we must just do what he did in his earthly ministry. Think about Jesus. What did he do? He went to all the towns and all the villages and he was preaching the word. He was calling people to believe in him. He was calling people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Those who believed in him became his disciples. They followed him and eagerly listened to him. They became believing, obedient learners. And that's what a disciple is. A believing, obedient learner. And how you and I make disciples is exactly the same way Jesus did that. We need to preach the word. Listen what Peter says. He says in 1 Peter 1 verse 23, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. How did you become a disciple of Christ? Was it your parents preaching the gospel to you faithfully, reading the Bible to you? Was it perhaps your child that preached the gospel to you and you believed in Christ? In my case, my grandfather can say it on his deathbed. I had the opportunity to preach the gospel to him. He was about 90 and dying and he heard the gospel and he repented days before his death. Is it a Sunday school teacher? Is it someone who invited you to this church and you heard the gospel? For the people in Mauarero, the handful of believers that we had, it's because missionaries showed up and proclaimed the word of God. We preached the word. We preached the word. Please note that doing good Bible-based deeds does not make disciples. The miracles of Christ, those good deeds that Jesus did, I mean, he came in and he wiped sickness out of Israel. He kicked out every demon. He brought about health and he handed out free food. He created it. But that was not the purpose of his ministry, was it? A disciple is not a man or woman who is excited about Jesus because he makes me flourish in this world and causes me to have a better material life now, my best life now. No, think about Jesus' miracles. What did they do? Without fail, the picture of the Gospels and Acts is that the miracles pointed to the person of Christ and his message. They attested to who he was. This is your Messiah. Yeah, is the evidence. And constantly we see Luke draws us to the fact that it is the message that was important, not the miracles. Luke summarizes uh, the response to Jesus in Luke 4 verse 36. What is this message? And he says that after Jesus has done a miracle. He records the people go, what is this message for with authority and power? He commands the unclean spirits and they come out. Even the people on the ground understood that the demons being cast out and the healings and so on are pointing to a message. Verse 43, Jesus said in the same chapter of Luke, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also for I was sent for this purpose. The apostles too, we see that when Luke records for us the spread of the gospel, listen how he records it. He says, the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. The focus is the gospel message proclaimed from the scriptures. Doing good deeds as a Christian in the name of Christ is not making disciples. Listen to what one uh, missiologist, Hesselgrave, wrote, quote, People of goodwill of all religions and no religion can and do address the human need for food, 
clothing, shelter, health, education, justice, and so on. But Christians, and Christians only, can be expected to preach the gospel, win men and women of all nations to Jesus Christ, and establish churches that will worship and witness until Christ returns. End quote. Friends of mine, uh, Brian Biederbach and Joel James, wrote an article in the Master's Seminary Journal, and they wrote this. The Apostle Paul did not say that God was well pleased to save sinners through the foolishness of the gospel mercied, but rather through the foolishness of the gospel preached. You see, preaching Christ from the word, that's what makes disciples. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Now, what would have happened in Mauerero if we went in and we met all those material needs? We said, oh, there is a church. Let's just go in and serve them by doing these good things within the society. What would have happened? If we had not gone in and made the focus of what we're doing, planting a church and proclaiming Christ from the gospel, what do you think would have happened? Let me explain. I mentioned our people are animists. That means they believe there is a force, living force in the rocks and the trees. There are spirits all around you and all these forces act on you. And so for things to go well or things when they don't go well for you, you need to discover which forces are acting in on you and you need to manipulate them. So their life exists of a series of rituals and acts of obedience, which you must keep to within the society, within your home, within the traditions of the culture in order for things to go well with you. Now, yeah, is the stated aim of their paganism. This is the goal to which all those things aim. And we hear it every week. Okay, we do all those things so that things will go well with us. We will be healthy, wealthy, and we will live a life of ease. That is the goal of all their pagan rituals, of everything that they believe in. Well, bring along the Lutheranism, and what they did is all they did was keep the same goal, but now they say, well, we must be baptized. That's the first ritual. The second one is to take communion, because that then washes away our sins. But the result of doing that, and along with the pagan rituals, is that we will be healthy, wealthy, and we'll have an easy life. That's what they believe. So now I have a question. If we come in and meet all those wealth, the the needs, we bring in wealth, we bring in education, we make life easy for them. What do you think that does? It only reinforces paganism. They would have believed that now all those things we believe in are true and it's brought about the fruit. Even if we had gone in and done Bible translation, we would have reinforced that worldview. Let me explain. A few weeks ago, a man came to the door and he came there to the steps. Zach wasn't in the village yet. His name was Jeremiah. No relation to the Jeremy over here. Um, He came along and he said, I want you to come to my village, which is, if you remember the maps Jeremy put up, it's from where we are. It's just over the mountains, closer towards the coast. Different language. He came and he said, I'd like you to come and do this in our village. And so I asked him why. So he said to me, well, um, our young people are getting involved in all kinds of bad things. They're not, I guess it's crime and things, and they're not respecting our culture and our old ways. Therefore, um, and, and and the reason is, is because they speak pidgin which is the trade language. So I questioned him further, and and he said, well, I want you to come and do Bible translation and literacy so you can preserve our language. And so I said to him, Jeremiah, do you believe your language has power? And he looked me in the eye and he said, yes, it has power. Do you see, in his worldview, he wants us to come and do Bible translation so that we can preserve 
his language because his language, the words have power. The words have power. You say them in the right way, then you're going to get the health, wealth, and prosperity. And so he's blaming everything going wrong in his society on the language. He wants us to preserve the power of his language. So if we go in and do only Bible translation, guess what happens? We reinforce his worldview, which is pagan. That is not how you make disciples. It is only the proclamation of Jesus Christ as Lord from the word of God that makes disciple. And that is the only reason we have believers in our village today. You see, if we had gone in and done the social justice and upliftment on the day of judgment, I'm convinced Jesus would have looked at all those Christians from, Christians from our era and he would have said, depart from me, I do not know you. Well, let's move on. The next task that Jesus gives us after telling us to go and to make disciples, which happens through the preaching of Christ from the word, he says, you need to baptize those disciples that believe in me. And so that's the third task, to baptize. And you know that's a public declaration of the fact that you have fully submitted to Christ as your Lord. And you rely on his death on your behalf. And then what God has us do is those disciples, he gathers together in local congregations, as we are here today, where we are dedicated to learning from Christ and obeying him. We are born of the word. And we continue in the word. And so the final task is that we are to teach those disciples. Jesus says in verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Think about this, my friends. In John 14, Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. John 15 verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. You cannot abide in Christ if you're not in his word and you're growing. John 17, 17, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. That means we as disciples need to be taught the Bible, discipled, counseled. It all happens in the local church. You know, we are all disciples called to this mission. We don't all have the same role, but we are all involved, aren't we? We understand that the primary teaching and shepherding and counseling care is at, uh, at the hands of men. God has qualified elders who shepherd and care and preach and teach and are dedicated to doing that in the local body. But think about Titus. What does Paul give instruction there for the church? What must the older woman do? Teach the younger. What must mature believers do? We should be discipling the immature. Parents teach their children. Friends, disciple friends. That is the life of the local body. That is how we are taught all that Christ commanded us. That's God's design, and it happens in the context of the local church. And when the local church is faithful in these tasks, we send out people to do the same elsewhere. And so the church fulfills its mission, and Jesus builds his church. And don't miss this. This is the point. This is how Christ is building his church. It was the church on the day of Pentecost that proclaimed the gospel. It was the church that was then faithful to gather together, who were dedicated to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to prayer, and the breaking of bread. And it was the church that was faithful then to send out Paul and Barnabas and others to preach the gospel elsewhere. And what did they do? They planted local churches where they then appointed elders, and those local churches continued to grow. And do you realize that you and I today are sitting here because those men were faithful? That is one long line up to you and I today. And guess what? The line jumped over to Mawarero too. Isn't that wonderful? Well, the seventh aspect of the church's mission is that we can do this with confidence. Confidence. 
because Christ is with us. We live in a hostile world. We must preach the gospel in all kinds of situations, and it can be very daunting. And so Christ says in verse 20, Lo, I am with you always. Aren't those precious words? How do you think Zach feels right now? You read those words to my brother, and I read those words. Christ is with us. He's still building his church. He hasn't abandoned us, has he? That's encouragement. That's motivation. And that's what we'll stand on as we move forward. Christ is not distant, and neither is he temporary. And so we find that the final aspect of our mission is the duration. Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. How long must we work at fulfilling our mission? Right up until Jesus returns. That's the end. My friends, as we conclude this study, I want you to think of this. It is the church that is called the bride of Christ. It is the church that is the body of Christ, of which we are told Christ is the head. Christ gave himself for the church. And Christ promised in Matthew 16 to build the church. It's to the church we are told that he has given gifted leaders so that they can equip disciples to serve one another and to keep building his church. Is it any surprise that the mission Jesus has given is that of church planting? The needs that we have in Mauerero and all over the world, we know they are many, they are varied, but these truths, these eight aspects we find here in Matthew 28 show us that our mission is narrow and focused and we need to be dedicated to planting churches. Let's pray. Father God, I understand that I'm preaching yet to the choir, uh, to those who are well grounded in these truths. But we do, we do need to be reminded that our purpose on earth is to see you glorified as you build your church. Father God, we thank you for the privilege to be involved in doing this work, not only in Phoenix, not only uh, yeah, in Tempe, in Gilbert. I know there's a church plant and God willing soon to be um, elsewhere in this country, but also in Papua New Guinea. We thank you for the privilege to be making disciples and teaching them. Father God, there are precious disciples in Mauerero. Please be with them and encourage them. And help us with great wisdom to go forward and continue to do the work of building your church in Papua New Guinea. And we know we can do this because Christ is with us. And because Christ is Lord of heaven and earth. And we do praise you and thank you for the privilege to be part of this work. And we do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.